Welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to the Art of Programming Using Scala. Uh, we continue with our discussion of sequential execution. We're looking at writing scripts and how scripts actually run. And in the last video, we worked on writing a little script to tell you roughly how old you will be after a billion seconds. So let's go and let's look at that again. Um, we have a number of variables that we set up here at the beginning, and then we do calculations to find how many years, how many months, and how many days uh, into the uh, year you are. And then we print out an output here at the end. Now, what if we weren't interested in uh, 1 billion seconds? What if we were interested in 2 billion seconds? Well, I could come in here and I could edit that to say 2 and then save it and we could run it and it would give us an output um, but having to edit the program every single time that you want to run it with a different number is not very helpful it would be really nice if we could have this ask the user how many seconds uh, do you want you know how many seconds old do you want to consider a person to be and then have it so that the program would read in something that the user types in and it turns out that we can do that uh, there are uh, functions available in Scala and in this particular case the one that we'd like to do is called read int and now uh, as the name implies this is going to read an int from the user and because it, it's a perfectly happy expression here the value will be stored in total seconds typically if you're reading something um, especially if the user is supposed to to see uh, this and, and answer a prompt it's nice to put in something that prints out the prompt so here we print out the prompt, we ask the user a question, save the file, and now if I type in a billion, I get that. I can run it again, and I, what about only 500 million? And well, that's at 15 years, as you would expect. Okay, and we could play with with other numbers in there. But now this one script is significantly more use, uh, usable because it takes user input. Read int is not the only uh, read option there, there is. Uh, you will probably find yourself using, in addition to read int, you can use read line and read double. Um, the read double reads in a number and interprets it as a double, so it could have a fractional part. The read line will read in anything and gives you back a string. Now you might wonder what happens if I run this and I say something that's not an int. It could be a number like that, or it could be ABC. The result is the same either way. The program crashes. Uh, read int really needs to be given an integer in order for it to work. There are ways of getting around this. Um, we're not going to deal with them at this point. Uh, the, the book talks about them briefly, um, but we're not going to con concern ourselves with it. Uh, another thing that you should know about writing scripts, so someone might look at this script, and while the variable names in this particular script are reasonably informative, it still is possible that someone doesn't know exactly what's going on. Um, it's nice to be able to put in things that are in plain English um, inside of your scripts and programs, and we do this through something called comments. Now, at the very least, when you are writing comments for things that you're going to turn in, you probably want to include things like your name so that whoever is grading it uh, knows who the file was created by. Scala has two forms of comments in it. Uh, the one that I use most of the time, it starts with two slashes, and this is a single line comment. When you see two forward slashes in a program, 
everything from there until the end of the line is it part of that particular comment. So it doesn't have to be on its own line. We could put one here. Okay. So the thing about comments is whatever you put there, it winds up uh, being completely ignored by the compiler. So this can be written in plain English. It does not have to be valid Scala. Uh, you can put whatever you want there. And it exists primarily to help humans, uh, other humans, as well as yourself, figure out what is happening in the code. The other form of comment is a multi-line comment. And multi-line comments start with a slash star and then end with a star slash. And Typically, when you're using them, you'll wind up having those on different lines. And then you can type in multiple lines of comments in, in between them. So I could have a description of this program. This program asks a user for number of seconds and prints out roughly how many years, months, and days that is. Program written by Mark Lewis. Okay. Once again, being in a comment that is completely ignored, it does not affect the output of the program at all. It does not alter how it is run. Um, and especially if you are in a class, you should ask your professor, instructor, teacher how they want you to comment um, and, and how they want you to, to do things. Some, uh, some professors are very strict about wanting to have a certain amount of, of comments in the code. Others are uh, less so. So you need to fo uh, follow whatever guidelines um, they have for you. There are uh, two other things that I would like to, to mention um, here. One that was not hit upon earlier, and I will just go into the REPL for this. If you are creating a number of variables, so let's say I want to create variables A, B, and C, and um, I could put them all on separate lines. Uh, there is a more compact way of doing this, and that is to use an assignment from a tuple. So actually, first, let's do this. So val t equals, remember, tuples are uh, values that can store multiple things inside of them, and each of the things could have a different type. So for example, that. I've created a tuple, I've given it the name t, and it is a three tuple of a string, an int, and a double, and it has those three parts to it. And we saw previously that one way to pull these out is to use the methods underscore one, underscore two, and underscore three to get at each of the elements in there. Um, you can use this, it is often a short and an effective way of pulling things out of a tuple. But if I were going to be using, for example, underscore one a lot, uh, this can start to get literally ugly in the code. And it's also not very informative. Um, Mark here, well, that's my name. And it might be nice to have it so that when I pull it out of the tuple, it has a name associated with it. You can do assignments uh, from tuples, and this uses something called pattern matching, which we'll get into more detail on uh, at a later point, but it's helpful to show it. Now, when you do a val or a var uh, creation, you can put a set of variable names inside of a tuple on the left-hand side of the equals, and then have a tuple over on the right. And it could be a tuple like I set up here, or I could actually type in you know, something on this side as well. And what that does is it actually creates 
new variables for each part of the tuple and gives them the appropriate uh, value pulled out of the tuple that's over here. And we'll see a number of places where this can come in handy. So at this point, you now have a foundation for writing simple programs in Scala. Your programs can't do that much more than maybe a basic calculator could. You could possibly do a few things with strings. You might find that you want to play with looking at what Unicode characters look like or something like that. Uh, you can play around with different things. And the thing is, you should. Okay? Learning a programming language is much like learning a foreign language. And the best way to learn a foreign language is through immersion. You put yourself in a position where you hear people using it and where you try to use it yourself on a regular basis. Cramming for a foreign language does not work. Okay? And the same is basically true of programming languages. The best way to learn a programming language is to use it a little bit every single day. If you wait two weeks uh, to write your first line of code, and let's say you have you know, a, a test or a quiz at that point, and you haven't written anything up until then, you are at a significant disadvantage than if you had taken the same amount of time and spread it out. So try to take, I don't know, 15, 30 minutes every day or so, and do exercises, write little scripts, do whatever. Uh, it's possible that your instructor will have a way for you to, to do particular, particular exercises, but try to immerse yourself in, in this because the proper way of learning it is not through memorization. And the, the proper way is to not just try to force everything in your brain. Instead, it is to utilize it on a regular basis and have the things that you use stick so that you get a much deeper understanding of them. So that's it for this video. And next time we'll come back and we will begin working on chapter four.